I can always tell when the plants are ready. The stigmas change from white to red and gold. Most of the outer leaves on the bush turn brown. They wither and die, blanketing the bottom of the closet like spent pine needles on a forest floor. The flowers mature, eagerly waiting to be fertilized, and form little seeds in the dense bud like pearls in the thick flesh of a clam. But offspring, especially in the case of marijuana, is usually unwanted or at the very least unattended. The closet breathes as if it were alive. Several fans sit on the sort of cheap beige carpet one might expect to find in any random apartment complex. The plants all sway in the circulation of air, all top-heavy with dense flowers. I reach into the closet to find the switch for the sodium lamp and hold my right hand up to block the light from my eyes. The silhouette of my hand and its remaining fingers startle me. It still sometimes seems an alien thing. My hand has five fingers. Five. Whose hand is this? I find the switch at the bottom of the cramped closet and turn off the sun. The bulb continues to glow for several minutes, brightly at first, and then fades into a tiny dancing spark trapped behind the glass. I itch absently at my right hand. A lot of people have been waiting for this harvest. Well, not really. Just Mom, Rocky, four or five of my closest friends. Better to say that a few people have been eagerly waiting for it. It has always been my intention to keep most of the pot for myself, but I do let some of it go to friends and family. I always like to see the looks on their faces when they see what I've produced, either from a thin tendril of green cut from another plant or a tiny inconspicuous brown seed. My father seemed to get that way too, about the furniture from his workshop. Sometimes I think he enjoyed the customer's first reaction almost more than getting paid for the work. It's not hard to understand, really. Nothing feels better than creation. Taking something from its rawest form and refining it to flawed perfection. I remember reading an article not long ago that said creating releases certain euphoric chemicals in the brain. Nothing beats creation. Nothing except someone else appreciating that creation. My father has lost the capacity for creation. Edward, my partner, hasn't shown up for harvest time. It's my own fault, really. I have a habit of waiting to the last minute to notify him that it's time to pull out the shears and hang the goodies like Christmas stockings. He always gets mad when I do, because he's fully aware I know days in advance the exact date of the harvest. If I know Edward, and I do, he's probably with one of his many girlfriends. Being a grower, it's often difficult to bring home any date or new acquaintance. While twin air purifiers work to remove the incriminating odor from the bedroom, it's still quite noticeable. A sex life really isn't that important. Damn Edward. He knows how hard it is for me to trim since losing the fingers on my right hand. Fortunately, I'm a southpaw and can still manage to reap the harvest, though much slower than if both my hands were whole. Sometimes the fingers that were sheared off on my father's table saw a hurt itch, and I'll forget they're missing. And then I attempt to do something like roll a joint or play a video game, and I'll remember when those digits fail to respond to my commands. For some reason, I always smell sawdust when that realization hits me. The workshop had become the nucleus of our relationship, the shiny core that magnetically held me and my father together. I suppose family businesses are like that. Before I moved out on my own, it was the family dinner that held us together, the dreaded affair where my father could sit across the table from me in a well-lit room and clearly see the whites of my eyes, or the reds of my eyes, depending on whether or not I had any visine. Now, for me at least, it was the paycheck that allowed us to speak to each other every day, if only briefly. The old man spent more time away from the shop than in it since he was often trying to drum up business, though he would usually drop by at least once during the workday. I didn't mind his absence much. He pressured me too much about college. But he never offered to foot the bill. Another guy worked in the shop with us, Rocky, an outsider to the family. His name seemed out of place to me. He was a soft, friendly guy with an easy smile and mischievous gremlin-like eyes that hid behind a shaggly gray beard. Rocky's hobby, his passion, was flying kites. I remember seeing an entire armada of kites in the back of his truck. 
sometimes on windy days, I would find him at the park on his lunch break. The string wrapped around his fingers as he stared contentedly at this gliding extension of himself. It didn't come as a huge surprise when Rocky asked me if I could score him a little pot. Rocky was the shop foreman. He has a scar that runs down his right forearm in a cruel zigzag. One morning, after hearing Dad lecture me about college, Rocky sat down a plank he was sanding on the assembly table, pointed to the scar. He's right, you know. I looked up for my work. What? Rocky held his forearm so it was plain to see. You should go to college. If you do this for a living, one day, like it or not, the blades catch up with you. 23 years old and bulletproof, I grunted in response. Rocky and my father occasionally left the shop together for a delivery or an installation. Sometimes I would go along if the extra manpower was needed. If not, then I worked the wood alone and rang to my hall of heavy machinery. Rocky's bluegrass and honky-tonk would become hip-hop and metal. The harder rhythm seemed to suit the work. For some reason, and I know it seems silly, it still amazes me that the blade on the table saw didn't even slow down when it hit my pinky finger, as if a blade twirling at 4,000 RPMs is really going to slow down for a bit of bone and meat. I didn't feel a thing when it chewed through the pinky and then right through the neighboring ring finger. I say chewed because the blade didn't even have the decency to make a clean cut. It hamburgered my fingers, turned them into pace, making it impossible to reattach. I don't recall what was going through my mind when it happened. Maybe I was thinking about a girl. Maybe I was thinking about smoking some pot behind the shop since no one else was around. The blade flung a thin line of blood in a semicircle on the ceiling and the wall behind me. Later that night when I looked in the mirror, dizzy from painkillers, that same thin line ran vertically down the right side of my face. I remember looking at my hand in dumb disbelief as blood squirted out in a familiar rhythm from when the fingers had just been moments before. Rocky and my father came walking through the shop door just in time to view my very own old faithful. The spring sunshine splashed into the workshop at their feet. Thank you.